good uh, good evening good morning good afternoon wherever you are and very welcome to this uh, webinar the pandemic is still with us and many in india like in other parts of the world are continuing to struggle with its devastating impact on all aspects of life in india last year the images of informal migrant workers walking back to their villages with pregnant wives and old mothers with children dozing off on pull along suitcases due to extreme fatigue and exhaustion or riding hundreds of kilometers on their fathers shoulders are still brutally etched in our hearts but things didn't improve subsequent waves of disease and lockdown have meant that economic recovery has not been stable and workers continue to cope with crisis of income debt and care the existing risks and challenges faced by informal workers due to their lack of social protection access to good health care access to sanitation infrastructure and good housing have all been exacerbated due to the pandemic as the as the pandemic unfolds it has also unleashed and disproportionate gendered impact on livelihood as it increased the care burden of women informal workers a study by one of the leading universities in india uh, shows that an, an, uh, 7% of men who lost their job during the lockdown and did not recover them by 20% as compared to 46.6% of women who lost their job without rec recovering them during the same period so obviously the women are suffering far more similarly a vigo crisis impact study in delhi in 2020 um found that nearly 60% of female respondent reported increased time spent on childcare during the pandemic which subsequently resulted in lesser number of days of paid work when lockdowns eased and lesser earning than those who did not report increase in time spent on child care naturally uh, with entire families stuck at home during the lockdown in periods of 2020 and during the second wave in india in 2021 more time was spent in cooking cleaning taking care of children but also care of elderly and sick <clears throat> with the closure of child care facilities the children have suffered too many children were deprived of their essential sources of nutrition and a stimulating environment for growth which is expected to have long term impact on education health and nutrition and overall overall well being of the children the early childhood education and holistic child care has been hampered due to the closure of centers and the absence of any learning environment at home lack of social interaction nutritional deficiency lack of immunization and decreased immunity have led to increasing health issues amongst children in many ways the covid-19 pandemic is a triple crisis at its origin it's a public health crisis lockdown and social distancing have led to an inevitable economic crisis and with closing of creches anganwadis and child care centers these measures have contributed to a care crisis the impact of the triple crisis are multiple and will be felt for a long time and across many generations of informal women workers and their children the road to recovery must acknowledge and address this the need to invest in affordable and quality child care services was never more pronounced than it is today especially for those who work in the informal economy and their families so in this first channel, um, panel uh, we have uh, uh, three panelists uh, each of them uh, has been engaging in research and policy advocacy based on their research on the impact of covid-19 on the livelihood of women workers and on their care responsibilities and how they have impacted their uh, choices in going back to work and in the recovery path first of all i have with me kanika jha kingra kanika is a senior policy and advocacy manager at iwage which is an initiative of lead and action oriented research center of ifmr society she spearheads the organization's advocacy and policy engagement strategy 
to promote evidence-informed decision-making on women's economic empowerment. Kanika has over eight years of experience in leading advocacy, communication, and research uptake strategies in international development. Welcome, Kanika. Kanika, the first question that I do want to ask you um, uh, is uh, about a research that you have done uh, on um, uh, the in rural Orissa. Orissa is one of the states in the eastern part of India, and you have done a uh, impact of COVID and looked at it through the lens of SAGs. What are the key findings? Can you share with us? Thanks a lot, Shalini, and thank you everyone who's joined us today for this webinar um, on a very critical issue. Um, so very briefly, uh, Shalini, I'll just talk about the study and just set the context also for our audience who are joining us from other parts of the world. Um, a lot of the, uh, you know, in the last one and a half years and now almost two years, uh, we've focused on the impact that um, urban areas of India, uh, you know, suffered through during the, uh, you know, how the pandemic unfolded, whether it was the health crisis or the economic crisis. Um, at least in the first few months of the lockdown, the economic measures that were underway to sort of, um, you know, in at least June, July onwards, uh, very little focus was also, uh, Put on rural India, which is where uh, this year the you know a significant uh, impact has been in terms of the health crisis, but also the economic crisis. Um, so uh, just to you know uh, setting the context for the study that you talked about, this was a study that was done in, in partnership with uh, PCI, as well as um, the Odisha Livelihoods Mission, which is a state-run livelihoods mission um, under the uh, sort of the overarching umbrella of the Ministry of Rural Development's National Rural Livelihoods Mission. Um, and essentially, the idea behind conducting the study was as part of a long term engagement with the state around strengthening gender transformative policies and uh, focusing on strengthening the gender strategy of the livelihoods mission in the state. We were trying to understand and unpack really what's happening um, at the ground level with some of these women who are part of the self help groups, which are essentially women's collectives under this mission. Um, and so the study was conducted in the month of June. Uh, my colleagues Anu Sanyal uh, from IVH led the study at RN and a few colleagues at PCI, where they um, conducted phone surveys with close to 423 women across the state of Odisha, particularly in two districts of the state. Um, and we looked at a couple of questions. One was, of course, the overall well-being of these women when it comes to, uh, you know, whether it's health-related impacts, nutrition-related impacts, the impact on their income, etc., as well as looking at other aspects that have affected uh, their sort of everyday, day-to-day -day life, uh, whether this was the uh, sort of, uh, you know, large scale of unpaid care work that came their way, or as well as a mental health crisis that was unfolding. And as most of the studies that have shown us over the past few years, whether these are global studies or studies out of India, uh, we did find significant uh, impacts on their overall well-being. Um, close to 83% respondents reported that they did not have sufficient food. Uh, women uh, mostly belonging to low-income households and below poverty line households uh, were particularly vulnerable and affected. And that's exactly coming to your point about the nutritional related impacts. So women and girls are generally the last ones to eat meals at the dinner table, which meant that nutritional impacts were far worse for them, uh, which meant that, uh, you know, the food basket in the household was affected, um, how it gets prioritized among male children versus female children also um, was a concern. Uh, apart from that, we did sort of see significant findings when it came to unpaid care work burden. Um, close to 70% women reported that they spent more than six hours every day on household work that is emerging out of global statistics as well as, as, well, as, well as other studies in India, uh, with over 50% reporting that there was an increase in their household chores, um, and 59% saying that largely part of those sort of unpaid work was focused on childcare uh, work. Uh, but beyond that, we also try to unpack the findings around mental well-being. Um, and I think that's a critical piece that we should all focus on when we're talking about childcare, because a mother or a care provider can't really take care of a child or provide that sort of, uh, you know, support to a child if their own well-being is largely affected and impacted, um, you know, 
on a day to day basis because they're constantly you know trying to make ends meet they're living in sort of precarious conditions um, and what we found was that 66% women reported that they were highly stressed which was largely an impact of food insecurity but also a loss of income and livelihoods um, and that's you know specifically the study that um, you know you talked about but uh, Sean, if I just have a minute uh, to also very quickly touch upon another study that um, you know our, our organization lead uh, uh, conducted, which was with around 2000 women. Uh, these were women who owned their own enterprises and these were small scale to uh, sort of medium sized enterprises across four states, which were in Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, Chhattisgarh and Odisha, which are primarily states you know, in the central and eastern parts of India between June and July 2020. And while this was a survey was focusing only on women owned and led enterprises and the impact that COVID has had on their supply chains and gas supply, we did find that one in three women entrepreneurs had completely shut down or temporarily closed down their businesses. The primary reason that they stated was that the burden of unpaid care work had significantly increased, and that was close to 40% of the respondents, which goes to show that if we are talking about economic recovery and we're talking about resilience and recovery plans globally at the national level, um, we cannot do without public investments in child care and strengthening the child care system. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, thanks, Shalmi. Thank you very much. That was very insightful. Um, so uh, in just one in one minute, if you were to make some key recommendations or suggestions for going forward, uh, particularly to address this care burden, what would that be? Right, so if we talk about the rural context, I think there's much uh, that can be done around care provisioning at the rural level. Uh, particularly when we think about generating employment opportunities also for women which who can play the role of care providers now uh, you know there is there is ongoing sort of advocacy efforts globally with the generation equality forum and there's a global care alliance and these call to action to invest in the care economy but at the rural level i think there is a uh, you know, much concerted effort that needs to be put in and how to fill existing vacancies uh, when it comes to care provisioning at the local level. Um, while centers can be strengthened and set up in the absence of skill um, and, uh, you know, in the absence of decent work for these care providers, I think very little can be done. Um, so I'd say number one, at least in the rural context, is to fill those vacancies and provide that kind of support to care providers to come and uh, extend care provisioning at the rural level. Um, and I think second, uh, you know, just talking about the global context as well, I think one particular concern is how do you ensure that uh, private sector also emerges as a key actor? We're talking about public provisioning of childcare. But if we see in India itself, at least in urban areas, construction sector and the garment sector were the most affected. And that's where a lot of migrant workers started returning home. But can we create and think about a social compact um, and sort of a gender compact where uh, childcare is at the center of those recovery efforts in partnership with the private sector who play a critical role in employing a large section of India's migrant population. So uh, essentially- Thank you. Thank you very much, Kanika. That was very, very helpful. And I will now move on to our second speaker, um, Monica. Monica Banerjee is a research fellow with the Institute of Social Studies Trust, ISST. Uh, currently, Monica is associated with a gender mainstreaming project which focuses on engendering policy process and public discourses through events and research. So welcome, Monica. Monica, <clears throat> you have been recently involved in a study that ISST has conducted on childcare centers which are run by SEVA. And you try to look at um, the impact on um, women workers and their children in during the lockdown and the following unlockdown phase. What does the study say about unpaid care work of mothers or the need, the critical need for institutional child care facilities for women informal workers? You're mute, uh, you're mute, Monica. You need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Thank you Not so much, Shalini. And uh, I would like to say uh, at the onset that the study was done with along with SEWA. So SEWA and ISST collaborated and we together collected the data. 
uh, the the objective behind this this study was that you know we were finding a lot of studies coming up and there were a lot of conversation about informal workers uh, there was also a lot of conversation about children missing out on schools but there was hardly any conversation about children in the 0 to 6 age group what was really happening to them we know that the icds centers and all the child care centers were had shut down since march uh, 2020 and they're still shut down some of them some of the uh, NGO run have opened, but you know, uh, intermittently they don't have the same number of children. So what is really happening? Now, if you try and see what kind of studies have happened in terms of zero to six years, hardly any. There are, you would find some newspaper articles which talk about the importance of ECCE, but there is hardly anything about ECCE. Well, we know that the children are at home, especially in terms of uh, unpaid care burden of the mothers, who is really giving them the kind of attention? So that was the main objective behind the study and to our kind of understand. So obviously, I mean, during the pandemic, we couldn't have done a very large study. So we just took up along with uh, SEWA, the, the Sangini Corp, the Pal SEWA centers that are being run by the Sangini Cooperative of SEWA. And uh, all the 10, 11 centers which are being run in the Ahmedabad city, which is uh, one of the one large city in the state of Gujarat, uh, and mostly the women uh, households that the, these, these centers cater to are uh, home-based workers or domestic workers, mostly home-based workers, street vendors, uh, husbands working in nearby factories, or again, as home-based workers or as drivers. These are the kind of families that these, uh, these Balseva centers uh, uh, have been catering to. And all these, about 143 families have been sending their children to these centers. So, you know, the families were chosen in the sense that whose children have been going at least six months prior to the pandemic. So, you know, they already, already have certain amount of understanding experience of going to a, a full day childcare center. So what was really happening? So what we found really in terms of the family, as well as, you know, the effect on the child, 99% uh, of these households had lost their primary source of income. In fact, 69% of the families both husband and wife had lost their source of income. So both the primary earners of the family had lost their, their main income. And uh, there was no source of income during the uh, lockdown, definitely. But even after the lockdown, you know, the lockdown got over in May, May end. And we did this study in uh, December, January, uh, December 2020, and January. And majority of the women respondents still were not in the workforce. They were still out. And one of the primary reasons was that the zero to six year old children were home. They were not able to come out. We found out about the unpaid care work and obviously the burden was immense. But uh, the, the women did say that they get some kind of help from their family members, specifically their in-laws. But when it came to you know, the child care work, specifically for the zero to six years, now these are very young children. They need uh, attention in terms of feeding, in terms of using a toilet, in terms of sleeping, they need a lot of attention. The, the primary carer was mother. It was the mother's duty to, to do all of this. Obviously, the women were, they said that they had no time to rest. The family members were constantly at home. There were number of meals being cooked, number of times the tea was being made. There was also this uh, stress and tension in terms of, uh, you know, not having work, and especially husbands not having work. Uh, there was also some uh, uh, findings in terms of uh, uh, substance abuse amongst the husbands, which was again becoming a stressful uh, factor for the families. And so our idea was to find out what is the effect on the mothers and then, of course, on the on the children. And okay. what do we... Yeah, so basically that was where we were uh, in yeah. the objective of the study. So thank you, Monica. And just to clarify that this was in urban settings. So unlike what... Yeah. The, so this was an urban setting in a state in the western part of India, in Gujarat, Ahmedabad city. Yeah, this research was carried out. Monica, in the study, you make a very interesting recommendation about looking at community-based community provision of care as a model for disaster resilience care infrastructure in future. What do you mean by that? And uh, how did this come about? Is, is it, did it emerge through the study findings? And what were those findings? And what, what, what is the kind of recommendation you are making vis-a-vis -vis the point that I've raised? So if you, if you kind of go back to the history of how the Sangini Cooperative started, it's a collective. So for the mothers, as well as the Sanginis, the Sevikas, they are all members of these collectives, right? So they are part of the community. There is a sense of ownership in terms of uh, in terms of running these centers. And what we found, and this was not one of the objective of the study, but what we found was that when the centers start, you know, when the lockdown happened, 
The sevikas did not leave their children. The centers were shut down, but the sevikas did not leave their children. I mean, through their own initiative, they started uh, distributing food. They started uh, distributing ECCE, you know, early childhood learning uh, material. But more of more than that, they were like a support system for the family, especially for the women workers. They were like pillars of strength, you know, talking to them, uh, easing out their stress, telling them that things will be all right, not to worry about things. And what has really come out from the study is that, I mean, there may be several faults in the, in the, in the, in the way the, the center are run. One can come into that. But the way uh, the child care center is not only about, uh, you know, uh, easing the burden of the mother and, you know, about the child care. I think it is also about bringing the community together, especially in a pandemic situation, especially in a disaster kind of a situation like this. What we found, and this is not only about the Sangini Cooperative, uh, we, we are, ICST is also right now involved in uh, bringing out a compendium of child care centers run across India. We have small organizations running small centers. And what we found is at their own level, each of these centers are doing some bit for these, these children and these families. And it is not just about giving nutrition, but also as a support for the family. So I think Thank that's you, commendable. Monica. Yes, yes, absolutely commendable. And the role that these child care centers have yeah. uh, played in um, uh, supporting families of informal workers. Uh, our next speaker thank is, uh, thank you, Monica, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sumitra Mishra. Sumitra Mishra has been involved uh, both in research and advocacy. She's the executive director of Mobile Crash, an organization working for the rights of marginalized children to access early childhood care. Their work spans from grassroots level intervention to policy advocacy at the national level. Sumitra comes with over 20 years of work experience in the development sector in India. Her direct work experience with disenfranchised communities of children and women has been the pivot of the strategic programming, fundraising, organization, development, and policy influence abilities. Thank you, Sumitra, for joining us. With Sumitra, you, we, uh, I, with you, I want to travel back to the heart of this country, Delhi, the capital of Delhi. And um, ironically, um, in Delhi, uh, the malls have opened, the picture uh, theaters have opened, but our childcare centers have not opened. So I um, want to ask you about the work that you have been doing uh, with ICDS. So just for our, just a small um, um, two, two lines about ICDS, which is the Integrated Child Development Service. Uh, that uh, government flag it is a f government flagship program for child care and also it is one of the la world's largest program providing for integrated package of service for holistic development of the child so mitra i know that through this period of lockdown opening up second wave you have been looking at the services that the, uh, these centers, uh, how they have been uh, providing these centers and almost doing a reality check on the reach of these idea, ICDS centers. Can you share some of your findings from that work? It's, uh, you are on mute. Sorry. Uh, so yes, you're right that um, uh, very soon after the lo first lockdown was announced last year, uh, around April, um, a, a ground collection of partners, basically Delhi Me Forces, which is a state chapter of the National Forum for Crashes and Child Care Services, uh, sprung to action in terms of doing a quick reality check, both online and offline, during the height of the lockdown to check the access of uh, um, young children under six years of age and pregnant and lactating mothers access to the ICTS services. Um, the first part of the study that I'll refer to for today was conducted between uh, May to September of 2020. And I must say that there is a further study that has happened now, uh, which gives us some interesting comparative results also. But during the first part, as soon as the lockdown hit, we saw that uh, between May to September, the dry nutrition service distribution improved significantly from somewhere between 20% in April, May to around 60%. And that was covering the dry nutrition supply at household level. It's another question that the nutrition quantity was not adequate or the nutrient balance was not adequate, but there was some nutrition reaching the families and the pregnant 
month, months. Um, but what was also interesting is that immunization for children got completely disrupted. So from around 12% in April, May, it rose to around 56% in September. But I must also add that our latest study uh, says that immunization within Delhi through the ICDS services reached above 90%. So that's one service that is on track now. And a lot of work has gone with the department in getting these things on ground. What we still don't talk about and what Kanika and Monica referred to is the care bit and to a large extent, the education bit. Whilst there has been a flurry of online education activities for school going children and rightfully so, and a lot of talk about children going back to school, what we are really not focusing on is the loss of learning at the most critical period of child development for children under six years and how they have suffered in the last 18 months. Educate access to any kind of online education remains between 10 to 12 percent in the city at ICDS levels even now. And there is still no talk about in-person ICDS services starting off. But what is the greater and the more invisible burden is the care burden. And there is enough data both globally and from different parts of the country that talks about the phenomenal increase in the care burden on, on women and what it means for women, but also in the absence of care where families do have to go to work, what it has meant for the protection issues for children. And there is enough evidence from our experience on the ground to show that children are facing much bigger increase in abuse and all kinds of risks to their protection. So that's a big issue that has come out to our study also. Uh, what I must also mention that in terms of the impact on women, what we found out that we're talking of public maternity provisions for women. Uh, through the study in our first phase, we, we saw that only 35% of women were actually eligible for the study or aware of the study. And they were not eligible simply because they did not have the minimum paper document requirement to, to factor their eligibility. But even amongst the 35% who were eligible, during the period from April to May, only 3% received maternity attack. And this should flag a concern for us that how are childcare and maternity public provisioning really reaching the people that it must reach. And the situation very much remains similar in Delhi, even now in the second phase where centers remain closed. But also I must flag that despite these low figures, we must acknowledge that the highest burden on reaching services and continuation of services has been on Anganwadi workers and ASHA workers, our frontline workers, who have had very minimum social protection available to them, very minimum protection against the health uh, disaster that has affected the, the world. And yet they have tried to do this door-to-door -door home based services that is available. So that's something to acknowledge. So going forward, if you're talking of reopening of care services, then what does it mean for our care providers is something to also keep in mind. Okay. Sumitra, so, thank you very much. Uh, I just, before we go, there are a couple of things, but before I take up on the last point you made about uh, recommendations going forward, I want you to dwell um, just very briefly, maybe a minute and a half on the construction sector because this is a sector which is employer of large number of workers. And you know, even before the pandemic, children's health and nutrition at the site of work has been an area of great concern. So what is happening there now uh, as um, the sector opens up? Yeah. A further invisibilization, let me say it's not great over there. Just our informal tracking study says that more than 60% of construction sector workers migrated back to the village in the setting that you described in your opening uh, sentence, uh, uh, Shalini. But also 18 months later, almost 40% of people who had migrated, uh, returned to their villages have returned to the construction sites. Does that mean good news for women workers and for children at construction sites? No, it doesn't because less than half the women are coming back to these construction sites. And why so? 
because construction industry is reluctant to employ women workers back into the industry. Uh, and there are multiple reasons. Liability for, for employing women is one of the big reasons. Lack of childcare spaces and therefore the safety of children and the reputation risk it means for the industry is also another reason that's pushing back women from the industry. One would imagine that the bigger developers with bigger project sites and access to more capital would be able to lead a shining example on engaging women and supporting women. But let me share here on this platform that the bigger the developer, the bigger is the pushback for women workers because bigger developers and companies have higher capital to invest in mechanization of the industry, which is pushing women back. So it is actually the smaller sites and the smaller developers that we are working with where we are seeing more women because they've got to hire those women yeah. for the other yeah. untrained, unskilled jobs. Um, also, I mean, because of what has happened in, in the 18 months that childcare centers have remained closed, uh, it has also meant greater abuse and risk and death of children at multiple sites. Uh, and one thing is clear to us from our lessons from the ground is that Construction companies are, are moving away from their obligation to provide childcare services, saying that it is our attention must be in getting more our work start, business started, engaging more workers in the in the industry and getting our, our profit margins intact so that we thrive and sustain this industry rather than providing childcare services. It is for the government or the non-government organizations, their responsibility to provide the child care and not the business house responsibility. Sorry. Thank you, Sumitra. Thank you very much. And we are running out of time, but I cannot let you go without asking you for your final recommendations in one minute, if you could give us uh, for policy stands, for uh, a sort of scheme architecture, or just identify key enablers uh, for recovery where childcare is at the core of recovery for women workers and their children. I think the first and the most overarching recommendation is that for policymakers to recognize the value of child care in the post-COVID period and in the recovery of the post-COVID period, therefore to recognize the role of women back in the economic force and how child care can be that. That connection is still weak. And the more we talk about it, the more we generate evidence and have real stories, possibly that's going to help. So that's my first thing that, you know, one has to start by acknowledging and recognizing that. My second quick comment over there would be that there are sufficient, at least in Indian context, there are sufficient legal mandates for worksite based child care to be provided factories, construction industry, uh, tea gardens, brickworks, get those activated. There is that provision already available. Poor implementation is affecting women and children. Just get those activated. The third point I would like to make is that you mentioned about ICTS being the largest one. ICTS is closest to urban and rural communities of women and children. ICTS has phenomenal scope to expand and reimagine its services to provide six to eight hours of care services to younger children. And with decent budget allocation and investments in ad adequate staffing for ICTS because we already know the problems that ICTS has. And my final recommendation is something that I'll pick from Monica and from Kanika is that we have to recognize that women within the communities are the strongest touch points for these children and, and, the, and the care providers. And there is this huge potential of supporting women as care entrepreneurs, as crash entrepreneurs, and subsidizing that as a business model across the communities. It helps for women within these communities to provide solutions that are far more localized than any government industry or NGOs can go and provide. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Those are brilliant points. And we come to the end of this session. Thank you to all the speakers and panelists. It has been a great, um, um, a, a very invigorating discussion in this session. We now move on to the next session. And I will hand over to my colleague, Rachel Moussier. Uh, Rachel is the Deputy Director of Social Protection Program at WIGO. She joined WIGO to lead on the child care initiative, looking at women informal workers' need and lack of access to quality child care. 
Rachel has worked closely with Vigo team and programs to develop and promote Vigo's child care campaign and across and beyond the Vigo network. Rachel. Thank you, Shalini, and, and to all of our sisters who've made this webinar possible um, today, and I'm, I'm really delighted to be here with you. I want to also thank the speakers just now in this first panel for such a rich discussion to get us started. Um, in this session, we have the honor to hear from three women workers in the informal economy about the challenges they and their members have faced during the pandemic in caring for their children, while also trying to work and earn an income during this really difficult time. This is a familiar obstacle for women workers in the informal economy. I mean, a lot of our work at WeGo and with some of the partners here at Sewa Mobile Crash have been working on um, access to childcare for women workers in the informal economy for decades now. Um, and what the pandemic has done is that it's exacerbated uh, this inequality between women and men in the informal economy because of their childcare responsibilities, but also between workers in the formal and informal economy, where workers in the formal economy may have had access to uh, specific social protection provisions, such as family leave benefits, um, health benefits, that workers in the informal economy have not been able to, 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 to rely on. In 2020, uh, to give you just a, a global context, um, uh, building off of what we've heard from, in, from the Indian context, um, we conducted the first round of our global survey at WeGo with over 2,000 informal workers across uh, 12 cities um, in Africa, the Americas, Asia, and Europe. And a key finding from this first round of the survey is that women informal workers who reported an increase in care responsibilities worked 33% um, fewer days than other women during the lockdown period. And this was the initial lockdown period from stretching around March, April of 2020. And because of child care responsibilities, many were unable to leave their homes, even if they could work or were designated essential workers. And after the restrictions eased in July 2020, what we saw is that women with care responsibilities were earn only earning about 50% of their pre-COVID levels, as compared to 70% for men. And of course, in our, in our survey, we saw that some men in all of the cities um, reported an increase in unpaid care work. Um, the negative effect of additional care responsibilities, however, uh, was more severe on women's incomes. And this really shows how, how crash and school closures that extended beyond the initial lockdown measures had a much more prolonged impact on women's workers' earnings and livelihoods as we're seeing from the evidence, the more recent evidence coming from, from India, which the panelists discussed just now. And so with us today to share some of their own experiences, uh, we, I have the pleasure of introducing to you um, Aline Souza. Aline is a waste picker and one of the national leaders of the National Cooperative, uh, Waste Pickers Cooperative Movement in, in Brazil. Welcome, Aline. Our second speaker today will be Ani Diof. Ani Diof is a street vendor and the head of the informal sector branch of the National Confederation of Workers in Senegal, CNTS. She's also a leader of this SIGAS uh, labor union. And finally, um, we have Parvina Ben, Banu Shaik, who's, who's a home-based worker who sticks stones and beads on Dupatas, and she's a member of the Sangini, the Sewa Cooperative, and is a mother of two young daughters, one of which we had the pleasure to see uh, a few minutes ago. So I'll start with Aline in Brazil. Um, Aline, could you start us off by sharing the situation you faced in Brazil since the start of the pandemic? Over to you. Bom dia, bom dia a todas. Hello, hello, everyone. 
everyone. It's a huge pleasure to be here with you in this webinar, very enriching debate, especially a debate that is very important for us regarding our children while we are fighting to have our rights regarding works and income. My name is Aline Souza. I'm a recyclable waste picker. I have uh, seven children, six sons and one daughter. I've been working in this for more for since I'm 14. Even when I was at school, I used to help my grandmother actually also because I think I could protect her, my grandmother from the difficulties and from the abuses and I'm the third generation that happens in traffic and on day to day with big waste pickers. And I'm the third generation of waste pickers in my family. And I lead one of the main unions of pickers in Brazil. I'm in my third mandate. I'm the director president, uh, we, which congregates 21 unions of pickers, more than 1,800 pickers about uh, which more than half is composed of women and I represent these pickers uh, within the national movement of pickers and the pickers of the federal district more specifically and I'm also in the coordination of youth women of the national union and associations of pickers in Brazil. Currently I am uh, I am in the program, currently I'm in college, my first year at law school. I try to administer my time between being a mother, a wife, a student, sister, daughter, picker, and all of the other functions we have. I'd like to thank you for the invitation the organizers it's very important for our speakers being here to contribute with this panelists that bring information and exchange very enriching information it's very important to know the global context of women workers especially regarding help provided to this woman regarding their children there are around 800,000 pickers, waste, recyclable waste pickers in Brazil, women and men, of which about 68% of our women. And most of them, of these women, if we consider that from 10 women in waste, recyclable waste pickers in Brazil, six are black women, from the from very poor neighborhoods and the leaders of their family the main income providers of their family we have the statute of children and adolescents and on article 208 of the federal constitution of brazil it addresses this topic that we're addressing today which is providing child care to children from zero to six so although we have the legal framework, the legal support, the reality is different. It's very difficult to put these children in the crashes in Brazil. And if we lived in a world of equality, of fairness, we wouldn't need to have priority. Just compliance with the law and the, what we're entitled to according to the law. So we try, we work to reduce this negative impacts we have so that we can have access to the crashes. So before the pandemic, it was difficult. And now after the pandemic, it's even more difficult. So it has been difficult to protect ourselves with the, all these pandemics and leading with the other realities, which is to stay at home, isolated since last year with our children at home without being able to work. From our side, the recyclable waste pickers, we always thought that 
for our work should be considered as essential work. We cannot stop recycling. We cannot stop picking waste because if we do, the, the waste will make things worse in terms of will pollute our nature, our rivers, the, the sanitary fillings will, will become over will be in excess in terms of waste so we cannot stop working so we have to stop earning income and we will we, we became hostage of public policies in terms of the money transfer and it was not enough anyways so we not only have to deal the fact that we had to stop working but also we have to start become teachers during the pandemics because the 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 classes were online and we have difficulty in accessing pressures online so we had to fill in and fulfill these these roles for all children of educating them and from my seven children three of them need the crashes and like myself there are hundreds of women pickers in brazil that need this assistance and that do not have them and that are in dramatically impacted by this so regarding the legal support that i have made very clear here and the entitlement we have to the crashes and with the shutdown of these crashes, we had to think of alternatives. And one of the alternatives that we found, whether having, for example, a member of our family to help us, that's one of the alternatives. But there's also another scenario where we were able to implement plans of security prevention to go back to work. And with that, have someone to to take care of our children so because uh, the pressures were won't back yet those who had financial support to pay someone to to take care of our children so those are the alternatives we think we thought of implementing to have someone to stay with the children while we could work so Aline. you have to work Aline. hi Aline. um just just to we, we um, just to make sure we have time for everyone, can you maybe just speak very quickly about um, what you have been doing, for instance, with the you mentioned working with an NGO in Brasilia in our in the sort of discussions beforehand. Could you just say very quickly a little bit about that? Yes, of course. One of the alternatives was to make partnerships with NGOs regarding recycling materials and especially electronically recycling materials. So we implemented a project called Digital Dignity, where the unions would pass through to the families, pick up the families of pickers these these electronic equipment so that they could access their online classes so we were able to serve more than 1000 families this is a project we value a lot the future of these children because if this child was affected i mean they were affected we can do something with that and also we can guarantee the food safety of these families we have resorted and asked to, to be able to gather food for these families. Thank, thank you, Aline. Thank you for, for that contribution. And I hope that maybe if we can, uh, we'll go to the other speakers and hopefully we can come back for some quick comments. Um, I'm going to speak quickly. I'm gonna to switch to French just now for the interpreters. Um, Annie, bonjour Annie, vous Annie. allez bien? C'est vraiment un plaisir de vous avoir avec nous aujourd'hui. Um, 
I would like for you to share with us a little bit your experience from your own experience during this pandemic in Senegal, but also could you share with us the strategies which you have implemented in order to address this problematic of childcare today, but also the need to work within this context of sanitary, sanitary crisis and pandemic. Over to you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Hello, very much. Very, hello, everyone. Hello, my dear colleagues. I am Annie Diu. I am the Confederation um, um, responsible. So I'm responsible for the National Confederation of Workers in Senegal. The experience which is ours during, have, has been ours during this pandemic has been very painful, particularly for women who were street vendors and market vendors, which I am a part of. You know, during the pandemic, the government had made the decision to close all markets, close everything around markets, stop all activities for street vendors, because they said that uh, markets were vectors for the virus, they would help transmit the virus. That was a very big problem for those workers because they were already a vulnerable layer of society and they couldn't have access to government help, which was given to other types of workers. This also had a bad consequence within families, within the families of those workers, because women who used to leave in the morning and come back home at night with food for their family did not have food and money anymore to bring back for their family. But we have managed to get something, even though it was, it was very small, considering the very large number of informal workers at the level of Senegal, and particularly in the capital, Dakar. The majority of women today struggle to make a living for their children to survive, and that's very worrying to us. I think ever since 2017, Vanessa, you might remember, you came to Senegal and you launched a campaign for childcare within working spaces. With the National Confederation of Senegal, it took us a year to study and see what strategy we could adopt in order to raise awareness about those workers informal workers in markets, but also to raise awareness uh, with uh, local governments in order to help us starting those childcare centers. It took us a year to prepare, and in 2018, we uh, implemented those campaigns uh, in the capital city in Dakar, mainly. Uh, there, there were campaigns in the 103 markets which are in Dakar, the capital city. After this, campaign, we realized that women really needed those childcare centers in markets because between 2015 and 2018, there has been uh, in Senegal a, a phenomenon of violations and rapes of children in households because parents had gone away to work. We couldn't go through a whole day without hearing that a very young girl, a three-year-old girl had been raped because their parents were away. So we implemented this campaign so that all women working on markets could help us during this process. But you know, in Senegal, there's n there isn't this culture, this habit of having a childcare center in enterprises, in companies. So 
with this campaign with the CNTS, the Confederation, it was quite hard because people didn't want to hear us in order to implement, to create a child care center. You don't need that much money, but you do need a little bit of money. Because we can't bring our children to the markets without taking care of them, without making sure they can have access to uh, supervision and healthy nutrition. So that took a lot of time in order to implement this, this whole awareness program. But we have managed to implement a pilot project in a mall, which is called Philippe Eboué, where the majority of women who come to this mall, to this market, live in the suburbs. And we've met with the mayor and we've asked him for the authorization to use the terrace of the mall to create a childcare center for those women who work in this mall in order to uh, save those children from pedophiles who go to those households when parents are not around to raise children. So the mayor agreed gave us his authorization to use this space. And that happened around July 2019. When we started building infrastructures and finding ways to, to find um, childcare workers who were going to look after the children of these women, those people have to be uh, paid as well. We also needed to find strategies to feed those children. Uh, these women have agreed to put money aside uh, each month, about 100 francs, uh, because I don't have a lot of money, towards this child care center, but it wasn't enough. So during those months, we have created a big campaign, a big fundraising campaign and awareness campaign in order to implement this pilot project. And, and we don't have a lot of time left. Could you please tell us what you want in, within this context of COVID-19? What we want during this context of COVID-19 is that we would have liked to help those women who came back to the to work, but who don't have the possibility to bring their children to their workplace. Because so far it is forbidden to bring one's children to the workplace because of the pandemic and we need to protect children. But protecting children, leaving them at home has risks and bringing them to markets also has risks. So what we suggest is to try and see from good practices which are successful in India or in other parts of the world, we want to try and see through WeGo what we can do to help us in Senegal in order to uh, implement this project, which is very important to us. Thank you, Annie, and thank you for sharing your experience with us. Apologies, I muted myself. <laughs> Parvina Ben, welcome and welcome to um, to your to your baby as well. It's a pleasure to have you both here on this call. Could you perhaps share uh, some of your experience um, in Ahmedabad with us today? Thank you. My name is Parveen Aben. 
Good evening to everyone. I'm speaking from Ahmedabad in India. During the lockdown because of COVID, I faced a lot of difficulties. We had a lot of difficulties at home because of not having money. Cooking and taking care of our children was a problem. We faced a lot of difficulties in that regard. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had no work. Whatever work we used to do, we no longer got any orders for it. Even our family members didn't have any work. We were all very worried because of it. We borrowed money, whatever little relief we got, that's how we fed ourselves and we were very worried because of it. Child care centers were closed and our children were at home and they used to make a lot of mess at home and taking care of them and cleaning up after them took a lot of work. It took up a lot of our time. <laughs> our children really troubled us during the lockdown because of the amount of work that increased. Slowly work is starting to come back. So childcare centers have recently opened and we have been able to send our children there. So little work we have been able to resume, like sticking stones on Dukota. During the lockdown, we had no idea where we could get money and how to run our household. When we So we had a lot of other work that piled up, but no paid work at that point of time. And um, Parvina Ben, could you, you are a member of the Sangini Cooperative. Could you maybe speak a little bit about what kind of support you may have received from the cooperative or any other relief measures that you may have, have received during that time? The child care centers had closed and during a, while they were at home, they refused to eat food, they used to get very troubled and irritated. At home, they had forgotten whatever little they were learning in the child care centers, refused to learn. At the child care centers, they used to still eat food, but at home they refused to eat. So they used to not let me work at all. When they were at the child care centers, I used to get some time to work. So the orders also stopped. And because everyone is at home, my care burden increased. We were very worried because of it. I faced a lot of stress because of it, especially because we had no money. We had to borrow money and somehow we managed. Thank you, uh, Parvina Ben, for, for, for sharing. Um, for sharing your reflections. And, and we, we really do stand in solidarity with you and Annie and Aline in, in these difficult times for yourselves and for the members in your organizations who are struggling with childcare amidst this pandemic and also struggling to, to find work and to earn an enough of an income. I think some of the, the just to draw out some of the some, some reflections just hearing from the three of you is just the, the absence of relief measures 
uh, for in most cases. Uh, just reinforcing that point that for so many women informal workers, there was no relief or, or certainly inadequate relief to really compensate for the loss of income and the, sub and the immediate increase in care responsibilities. And from, from all of your experience, yeah. I want to say something. Yes, please go ahead. So we did get a relief kit from the child care center with soap, sanitizer, a little bit of food. And this also give us food. So give us soap, sanitizers and food now that they reopen. So it has helped a little bit, especially since children, our children are able to go to the child care center since they have opened. Yes, thank you, Pavina Ben. And, and I think that's really important to underscore, as Monica did in her previous presentation, just the importance of community child care services like the Sangini Cooperative and providing co community level relief but also recognizing the lack of sort of state level relief or the inadequacy of state level relief uh, to really address um, care, women's increased care responsibilities at home. Uh, and, I, and, you know, as a continuation of the first panel discussion, I think this underscores just the, the necessity of public child care services as a key component of economic recovery plans moving forward. Um, and, and the need to, to bring together as each, as Aline, Annie, and uh, Pavina Ben have done, uh, this link between recognizing waste pickers, home-based workers, and street vendors, as well as domestic workers as workers, and securing their access to productive inputs and protecting their place of work, while also recognizing their deep need for, for uh, child care services. And, that sort of gender and class intersection is so critical to coming out of this pandemic on um, at least not and not losing the ground that that has been made in terms of of um that has been made in terms of progress with for women informal workers so i want to thank once again aline annie and uh, parvina ben for their candor and the time that they've given to this discussion today we really appreciate your reflections i'd also like to just state that there was a question by mubashira to um aline and it's been answered in the chat so the question uh was regarding this the the gender division of labor in waste management in brazil and it's uh, Sonia has kindly answered it in the chat. And it's uh, the, the cooperative movement that around 60% of workers are women. And however, only 20% of workers are members of co-ops and within the broader category, the gender division of labor is 68% male and 32% female. So just for those of you who wanted to uh, follow up on, those, on that question. So thank you very much to um, Aline, Annie, and Parvina Ben again, and I'll hand it back to Shalini to take us to the next panel discussion. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Rachel. We'll go straight to the final panel, um, and we look forward to listening from the experts in this panel. This panel is titled Building Back Together, The Way Forward. Uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction of the three speakers and then hand it over uh, to the speakers. Uh, so we have with us Am Amanda Devacelli, uh, who is the global lead for early childhood development at the World Bank. Very warm welcome to you, Amanda. Amanda has recently authored a new World Bank report, Better Jobs and Brighter Futures, Investing in Childcare to Build Human Development, and is leading a new major work program to support countries to expand access to childcare. I'm going to also introduce the other speakers so that uh, we move along. So we also have with us uh, Marieke Conning. Marieke Conning is a policy advisor in the Equality Department of the International Trade Union Confederation, ITUC. And her areas of work include the care economy, including decent work for domestic workers. Very welcome, 
Maria K. And then finally, we have uh, Mirai Chatterjee, Mirai Ben, Sister Mirai, as we all call her. Uh, Mirai Ben is the Director of Social Security Team at the Self-Employed Women's Association, SEVA. She is responsible for SEVA's healthcare, childcare, and insurance programs. She chairs the SEVA Cooperative Federation of 106 primary cooperatives. She's also the chair of Vigo Board. Uh, thank you to all panelists for being part of this panel. And uh, Amanda, would you like to start? Yes, thank you, Shalini. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I, I've learned a lot um, from all of the panelists. You know, I think that the stories we're hearing today, um, while deeply personal, are, are also in a way not unique. They're being echoed in countries all around the world. Um, and if there's one good thing I hope to come out of this, uh, it's that it's shining a spotlight on this urgent need for childcare, which existed long before COVID and will exist long after COVID. Um, but let's use this pandemic uh, and take this moment and try and build some momentum to get some action. Um, so I, I work at the World Bank and about two years ago, we started um, trying to write a paper reviewing the evidence around what we know about how childcare is good for children's development, how childcare is, enables women to work and promotes um, women's economic empowerment, is good for families because we know that when women earn more and control their resources, they invest more in their families, and also is good for economies and, and businesses and overall productivity. And we thought that that framing was very important. Childcare is not just a women's issue. It's not just a child's issue. It's everyone's issue. Um, and, and I will tell you honestly that when we started that work at the World Bank about two years ago, um, and some of you who are here in the, in the session joined us and helped us think about that framing and how to make a strategic paper. Um, it was not an obvious argument two years ago to many of the people I work with at the World Bank. Um, some of the debate was still a bit academic. You know, can you maximize female labor force participation and promote child development? It really wasn't being seen as, as a deeply personal and human issue that families wrestle with. No family wants to have to choose between earning an income and keeping their child safe. And in fact, most families don't have a choice, right? They have to earn an income and they have to find a way to care for their children. And so what we need to do, as Rachel was saying, is move beyond um, uh, the question of if and how, but, but begin doing it. And, and public resources are gonna be critical for this effort. We released the paper in March, um, and I think someone will have put the link to the paper in the chat. Um, what you'll see in the paper is that in reviewing the global evidence worldwide, we found that about 40% of the world's children below the age of primary school need childcare, but do not have access. We also found that if we expanded access worldwide to childcare to meet the global need, we could create 43 million jobs and that we could work together to make sure these are high quality jobs. Um, you can read a lot more in the paper about different ways that countries approach childcare, about all of the evidence about how childcare can, can help children, can help women, can help economies. Um, but I think that the, the paper took us a lot longer to write than we thought, but a silver lining is that it was released kind of in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, which gave it a, a bigger audience and more interest. Um, and, you know, what I see right now is a moment that we can take an advantage of um, to, to put childcare front and center in the recovery and in the efforts to build back better. Most countries right now are drafting COVID-19 economic recovery plans, and I've looked at them in a lot of different countries that I'm working in. Most of those plans include a section on supporting small businesses um, or on, um, uh, on um, microloans. Um, we can be targeting that kind of funding to say that that funding, skills and employment funding, job training programs, um, employment programs, uh, small business uh, funding, can all be channeled to the childcare sector, which will overwhelmingly support women to get employed, but also women as small business owners. There's also a lot of um, funding out there related to nutrition globally, which we could be using to make sure children in childcare centers get the nutrition they need and that we use childcare centers as ways to reach children and families with the nutrition um, that they need, especially in those critical first thousand days. There are cash transfer programs in many countries 
um, cash transfer programs are being rolled out right now, targeting the most vulnerable families. There are ways that that funding could be channeled to, to pay for childcare and get multiple returns for it. Um, and I already mentioned the, the skills and jobs programs. There's also a lot of urban planning type programs right now and, and urban infrastructure programs, which can be used to support childcare um, in urban, but also in rural settings. Um, to, to set up these settings and set up these facilities where children can be cared for, women can be employed, and we can enable women to work. Um, so, you know, I, the, the challenge is enormous. The needs are immense. We've heard um, about these deeply personal needs today and, and the um, immense challenges facing women and, and their families. Um, but I think right now, I, I do feel hopeful. I do feel that we have a moment globally um, to, to sort of seize the stage make the case for these investments in child care, show the way it can be done, show the data and evidence. I think that's why the first session was so important to show you know, what, what data are out there to, to, um, to show the need and show the opportunities and show the potential impact. At the World Bank, we're about to launch a major new work program across all of our different sectors um, and across all of our different entities. So our, our parts of the World Bank that give grants and loans to countries, but also our research units, our survey units, um, and all of our different sectors to try and find ways to use World Bank finance to expand access to quality, affordable childcare for all families that need it. But a critical way to make that happen is to make sure that governments are demanding those resources from the World Bank. So, you know, there's a role that institutions like the World Bank can play in trying to um, encourage those investments and um, generate the evidence to make the case for those investments. But at the end of the day, we also really need governments to, to choose to invest in these um, in the childcare sector. And that's where citizen engagement, um, good models, good partnerships, public-private partnerships and others are gonna be so critical. So um, I think we've heard so much today about all these issues and um, I really have appreciated being here with all of you. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Amanda. Really grateful for this input. Um, should we just go straight to the next speaker, Marike? Would you like to um, um, go ahead? Sure, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Shalini, for um, for inviting me here to to speak and to be with you all. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I think um, I will I will go get there very uh, very quickly when when I start with my my presentation. But there is indeed uh, momentum building around um, care and uh, building a, and shaping a caring economy. So that is absolutely true to uh, respond to the previous speaker. Um, I just would like to start um, that um, act, uh, with, with um, uh, the time just before the pandemic. Um, um, in the um, I2C has uh, did publish um, several pieces of research um, which indicated you know, that investments in care are, for instance, far more effective to recover from crisis or recession than austerity policies. And also um, that investments in care can create millions of jobs. So that is absolutely, um, yeah, very important to know within the context of the current pandemic. Um, but I also would like to refer to a report of the ILO. Um, they did uh, a of the International Labour Organization. They published um, uh, research in 2018, showcasing that if we do not act now, we cannot avoid a global care crisis. So that was already before the pandemic. And um, so investments in care are essential. For instance, they found that 2.1 billion people were in need of care in 2015, including 1.9 billion children under 15 and 200 million older persons. And by 2030, this number is expected to reach 2.3 billion. And um, so um, there is a, already before the, 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 the pandemic, um, the ILO showed with this report that there is actually a need to create 269 million jobs in the care economy. Um, they need to be created by 2030. So that um, is just to, to as a short intro, but now um, 
we all are witnessing how the COVID-19 pandemic uh, caused a global health pandemic and multiple crises. Um, actually, the pandemic revealed that decades of austerity, privatization, underinvestment, and structural adjustment affected national health and care systems across the world. Um, and um, yeah, we were unable to deal with the enormous impacts of the pandemic. And this affected our societies uh, deeply. So, for instance, um, as now research uh, is revealed, including by um, the International Labour Organization, it affected disproportionately women and girls who were already taking up the bulk of unpaid care uh, responsibilities. It actually increased enormously. Um, and women saw a disproportionate uh, loss in jobs and uh, in loss of income, which you also shared during this uh, this webinar, and this is actually shared across the world. And um, so the ILO uh, speaks of uh, job losses for women, um, about millions of jobs lost for women across the world, and um, and they are losing out more in terms of jobs to, compared to men. So. So also the pandemic showed uh, the poor working conditions, as you also have been speaking about, um, the poor working conditions of care and health workers, and particularly in the informal economy. And as we all know, that 70% of them are women. So um, a lot of, of action needs to be taken um, to build a, a gender responsive and adequate roadmap towards recovery and build a resilient societies and economies. So that's why unions say that it's high time to act. Um, a caring uh, economy forms now a central part of ITUC's collective call for action called a new social contract to ensure this gender transformative recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. And the demands include, for instance, the creation of millions of decent jobs, decent jobs in, the, in the care sector including in child and elderly care, uh, of course, with decent pay and working conditions, which is absolutely fundamental and very important as well for care workers in the informal economy. So we also want to see a formalization of informal care jobs um, and uh, including also the right to freedom of association and collective bargaining. And to, we also demand that um, unpaid care work is counted in into our economies, um, recognizing the enormous contribution of women in our society and the economy. We want also to see um, that uh, universal and uh, equi equitable uh, access is, is, is made possible to access quality public care, health and education services, including childcare um, and uh, so that is also an important um, part of this new social contract. And of course, decent work for all um, care workers. And um, this call to action for a new social contract is actually spread now by unions across the world, um, calling on governments to, to act upon it, to increase their investment. And also support for the care economy is growing. For instance, last June at the UN Women's Generation Equality Forum, various stakeholders, including governments, private sector, civil society organizations and unions, pledged support to implement uh, bold commitments to accelerate transformative action towards achieving gender equality. And um, those who support uh, the commitments pledge to contribute to its implementation by 2026, so in five years time. And it includes a bold commitment around care, actually multiple commitments around care. One of them being is um, aimed at increasing the number of countries with comprehensive measures in gender responsive public quality care services and law and policy reforms, including through investments of a recommended three to 10% of national income and creation of up to 80 million decent care jobs. So that is a, a commitment they want to achieve by 2026. And this is just one example of a whole set of commitments endorsed on um, the care economy. And I must say that um, the support for this commitment is growing. 
for instance, uh, as part of one of the action coalitions on economic justice and rights, which is comprised by a whole number of leads. Um, the ITUC is there, but also governments like from South Africa, Mexico, Germany, <clears throat> just to mention a few, but also the OECD countries are there. Um, the private sector is uh, represented there and other civil society organizations. And they have actually uh, talked about these commitments and endorsed the, these commitments. And Mexico, as one of the leads of this action coalition, launched the Global Care Alliance. And also there we see growing numbers of stakeholders, governments and other stakeholders joining this Global Action Coalition. Um, and so um, this really will deliver uh, and build up much more momentum to build and shape this caring economy. And this is absolutely necessary. Now, as ITUC, we're working very closely with um, other global union federations around the care economy. So with Uni Global Union, uh, Public Services International, Education International, uh, the International Domestic Workers Federation, and we go. Um, so we are all building together on a shared agenda on the care economy around the key points I just mentioned. And uh, so organizing um, for decent work for all care workers and um, including in the informal economy and to ensure that governments significantly increase investments in the care economy. And just to close, um, yeah, with um, by saying that um, with today's pandemic crisis, this joint collaboration of, of unions and of uh, and including WIGO is even of greater urgency. And um, so we are heading now as um, uh, together um, in the for the preparations of uh, the global for the next global action day on 29 of October, with, for uh, which will um, include a call to action to uh, on the care economy, and uh, this is an annual international global action day. And we expect calls to actions for a caring economy across the world by unions and allies. And very soon we will share uh, and make available uh, social me media materials to easily join the Global Action uh, Day. And yeah, I also would like to take this opportunity to, to encourage you all to join, to join the Global Action Day on CARE um, on 29 October, uh, so that we can all stand in solidarity and call on our governments to act by making a care, caring economy a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sister Marieke. Um, very, very inspiring presentation. Now may I go straight to Mirai Ben for her presentation. Thank you very much, Shalini. And so delighted to be here with so many friends and colleagues. Um, as many of you know, next slide please, SEVA is a national union of 1.8 million informal women workers and we are also an affiliate of the ITUC. Uh, we started organizing informal workers like my sisters in the photograph, street vendors, construction workers and hundreds of other trades um, mostly self-employed in the informal economy. And almost 50 years ago, it became very evident to us that it's impossible to organize women workers for their economic empowerment and self-reliance if we do not have childcare. And so we developed, uh, as we organized into our <coughs> union, also a childcare cooperative, and I'll come to that in a minute. Next, please. So as we organized our sisters, um, it became very clear to us that if they were to come out of poverty and move towards self-reliance, they needed those four pillars that I've showed on the slide, work and income security, food and social security. And within social security, as all of you can see, childcare is deeply embedded. So this came directly from our members as we organized them. Next, please. And that's why, as Monica Banerjee has already explained, we set up the Sangini Cooperative way back in 1986. It took us two years to register this cooperative because, as Amanda said, 
people don't understand child care and imagine what it was like way back in 1986 they said what will you manufacture how will you ever be viable but anyway uh, sangini is striving to be viable and at the moment as parveen banu said we have opened although the government integrated child development centers the anganwadis as we call them in india are still firmly shut unfortunately children cannot participate but seva zone cooperative is working and the board consists of elected women workers mothers and sevikas the child care providers like parveen banu next please i just wanted to show you from our own internal studies uh, before the pandemic it's a small sample but you can see that women's income more than doubles when full day child care is provided yes i should also mention that sangini cooperative provides full day child care according to the working hours of mothers which is different from the government's icds centers which as most indian colleagues know run for about 2 or 3 hours in some states a little more next please so before the pandemic already um over the last 50 years and several studies some of which have been mentioned but some of the older studies as well showed us that incomes of mothers even before the pandemic increased by more than 50% and other important impact like girls going to school older siblings malnutrition which is still a serious issue in large parts of our country improving but still a serious issue particularly for those under 2 years of age and importantly as has been mentioned by my seva sister parveen banu it builds solidarity at the local level i should also say cuz many of us on this call are actively organizing informal workers we found that it's an excellent way to organize workers into unions and cooperatives women workers because childcare is something so close to their heart so close to the families that immediately uh, they uh, want to organize i also would like to mention that during the time of covid because this unity because the solidarity had developed at the local level the child care centers became a hub for all kinds of support that you have heard of not just relief but counseling mental health support and so much more before i go on to the actual uh, action points and demands of the national child care campaign in india i think it's important to trace out the journey of the campaign in india because it's not only of interest to colleagues in india but perhaps it will be informative for our colleagues across the globe and i think the starting point came uh could we go back please thank you um the starting point came about 33 years ago with a seminal report which i'd like to i don't know if you can see it properly it's called shram shakti or labor power specifically women's labor power this is a seminal report actually it was the report of a commission chaired by seva's founder ila ben pat and one of the key recommendations is universal child care if we are to support the work of informal women workers 33 years ago and today before this webinar i revisited the recommendations and it's amazing the recommendations resonate with what all of us are saying here today um and also you know we can see that the this this has been a long time in coming and it's still an ongoing journey from the shram shakti effort this commission on informal women workers in india way back in 1988 was born forces which uh, my colleague sumitra referred to which is the forum for precious and early childhood care and this started working as a national campaign way back in 1988 with small branches in different parts of india and still very active many of them the next milestone was the national advisory council which was set up by the prime minister of india in 2010 and for the first time civil society in india got a chance to recommend action on a whole slew of of measures that would strengthen uh, the working poor of our country 
And one of the important recommendations was on universal childcare supported by the government, extending the government ICDS centers, as you've been hearing this ICDS integrated child development centers um, to full day, according to the hours of working people of this country. The next milestone I'd like to mention is in 2016, when forces joined hands with WeGo, and we had a national consultation, which brought together a lot of the strands and a lot of the needs that had been coming out over, well, the last 30 years, quite frankly. And we gave another little push because it seemed there was a window of opportunity uh, at the time in the government of the day. And that was followed by a number of regional consultations because India, as is often said, is many little countries. So across the country, North, South, East, West, Central India, we had several consultations. And from these consultations, from the grassroots, from the informal workers and others, very organically, our key demands and action points emerged. And perhaps we can have them up now. Thank you very much. The first, of course, is quality childcare as a right for all, for all workers in India, universal. And of course, as I've already alluded to, full day, free, quality care um, with investments by the government. Of course, uh, oftentimes our government is not able to do that. And so organizations like Mobile Crash and Sangini uh, fill in the gaps. But we do think it should be stewardship by our government, as many have already said, and an investment that we have calculated up to about 1% of Indian GDP. Already, there is considerable investment by the government of India and by our states on childcare. So this would mean an extension of that, not doubling, it's an extension to about 1% of Indian GDP. And this is what we uh, canvassed for, campaigned for, advocated for at the last election with all the political parties. And I must say there was some traction, but unfortunately the investments have been slow in coming. As Mareke mentioned, we also believe deeply that childcare should be considered decent work. Uh, there should be appropriate skills training as Amanda and so many others have said. Maternity entitlements for all women and developing appropriate and participatory mechanisms where the workers have a voice. Workers like Annie and Aline and Parveen Banu actually have a voice in running these centers. And of course, from our experience, we would say that unions and cooperatives and self-help groups of women, local organizations are best placed to run these childcare centers better than government, which tends to do one size fit all, but of course they have to invest and they have to make all the resources available. Um, I'd like to end, if I may, uh, Shalini, by uh, outlining some steps forward, what I think the national campaign in India uh, is considering, will consider, and perhaps is informative for informal workers and campaigns for quality childcare in other parts of our globe, of our world, of informal workers and their movements. First and most importantly, all these years we've learned that unless we as workers organizations organize, if we don't organize on this issue, then it's not going to be a visible issue. It's not going to be on state and national and global agenda. So first and foremost, organizing workers, organizing campaigns for awareness on the importance of childcare, sharing the studies, how childcare leads to doubling of income. Of course, many of the workers know this already, but this no, needs to be known by the public at large in the media and so on. And particularly in the States in India, because a lot of action is in the States. Second and importantly, and therefore we're delighted to have ITUC as our partner here today, getting unions and cooperatives and other allies, the early childhood, uh, early childhood care community, of course, the World Bank we're delighted to have here and other donors like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and so many others on board. I'm sorry that we haven't been able to yet get representatives from the cooperative movement, 
Fortunately, next week, the Women's Committee on which I serve of the National Cooperative Union of India is meeting, and this will be taken up there immediately. Next, um, action research. We've had some excellent uh, action research studies and the outcomes discussed today, but we need to do much more, particularly in parts of the globe and states in India, like the Northeastern states, from whom we don't usually hear. Then we need to, of course, engage with policymakers, both national and international, and we've made a good start here, and we'll need to do much, much more with the help of the World Bank, the ITUC, the Gates Foundation, and so many more. I think it's been really important to have this exchange, thanks to WeGo, with our sisters and brothers from other countries and learn from their experiences and their best practices. We have much to learn and share from each other. Next, I think in the Indian context, it would be important to weave in the whole issue of early childhood care with the right to education campaign, which is a strong campaign going on in India at the moment. And finally, least, last but not least, um, we have a national campaign run by our government called Poshan Abhyan, which is about uh, combating malnutrition, tackling malnutrition, particularly for the young children, particularly for those under two or under three years of age. And I think we need to do much more to join hands with that national campaign as well. So these are some of my thoughts uh, as action points as we move forward. And of course, there's still much more to do and more action points to add on. I thank you very much. And I'm so delighted to be with all of you here in our common journey for quality childcare for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mirai Ben. That was really very inspiring and so many ideas for moving forward. Thank you to all the three panelists for this session. We now uh, move on to the concluding sessions. I think we have about 10 minutes uh, we'll take and that'll be, um, moderated by Susan Thomas. Susan Thomas has been active in the field of development and health for the past 36 years. She's currently heading the health and child care department as national health coordinator in self-employed women's association, SEVA. Uh, Susan Ben, uh, do you want to take over now if there are any questions or issues that have arisen, if maybe this is the time for us to take it up, try to answer it. Thank you, Shalini, and thank you, everyone. Uh, it was exciting to hear uh, such, you know, inspiring uh, experiences. Uh, Amanda, I have, a, a, you know, the, some questions. I mean, we're talking to some people earlier. Uh, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, how do you think the global experience can contribute to pushing the agenda of this childcare campaign in India? Uh, and specifically, what do you think World Bank uh, can do to engage with Indian policymakers? This is for Amanda. Thanks for that question, Susan. Um, I'm not the right person to answer that question because I work very little on India. Um, we have a team that works on India with the government. Um, and they would be much better placed to answer that question in the Indian um, context. But from what I do know from working um, on, on a few pieces of early childhood education work in India, but also drawing more broadly and, and other countries is that, you know, the evidence is there on why we should be investing in childcare. Um, I think what's, what's probably missing in most countries is how you apply that evidence to the current policy environment. So what does that mean in India in this case, but in, in any country? What are the programs um, that can be piggybacked upon? And we've heard, you know, obviously the ICDS centers and we've heard of other ones today, but how do we operationalize the global evidence into a specific context? So I think it's really important to contextualize in the country, see what mechanisms are already serving your target families that could be adapted to have more of a childcare focus, what funding sources are available, that have similar objectives, um, but maybe aren't focused on childcare, how can we tap those? And then, you know, I'm, I'm the global lead for early childhood development. And what I've learned both within my own institution for the World Bank, but also working with countries 
um, is that early childhood development is relevant for any goal any government wants to achieve. And I think the same is true for childcare. And so sometimes we have to accept that governments might not have the same goals we have, but we can make our goal relevant to their goal. And it's just about formulating an effective argument and showing the specific path forward, showing how much it will cost, doing some creative modeling to show the potential benefits. Um, but you have such a strong ecosystem and so many strong um, uh, existing organizations and programs to build off of in India specifically that um, I really look forward to seeing how the, the next few years shape up. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, I'm going to move on to Marieke. You, you talked a lot about the care economy and how that is a central you know, focus in ITUC now. Uh, just uh, wondering if you could uh, tell us how RTUC would be able to play a role with our in, with your Indian affiliates, particularly uh, how we could engage with the trade unions in India to push this as an important agenda, the childcare, uh, as you know, as a national campaign, and how they could be part of our movement. Yeah, well, let me first uh, say that I'm very impressed uh, already with, with work being done and on, on the way in, uh, in India and led by the unions and by SIWA and with the presentation we just had from um, uh, Mira, it was um, really, that's really encouraging. And I, I do think um, where we as R2C can work with the unions in, um, in India is support um, this important call, and, and Mira, Mira could not point it out more clearly, the importance of organizing around care and around quality child care. Um, that is something where we can really uh, work very strongly on. This is actually work we're now doing in uh, quite a number of countries with, um, with uh, unions affiliated to the ITUC, uh, but also <clears throat> um, where we explore for instance, uh, potential uh, alliances and uh, partnerships. So not only across unions, but also uh, um, with other movements and including feminist movements. Because if we can build up that global <clears throat> and that local call and demand around care <clears throat> and quality childcare, then we will be able to, um, yeah, maybe shift the needle of the governments towards, um, yeah, um, investing in towards greater investments in this. And um, I just want to say as well that um, uh, I was also referring to, to the momentum which is building um, across the world and, and referring to the generation equality and the commitments around care which are coming out and this global care alliance. Um, I just want to say that um, at the moment, billions are being pledged in funding to make sure that those commitments can be implemented by 2026. Now, not all those funds will, will go there, but I do see that also that momentum we will use strategically at the national level and with um, yeah, the unions in India, we can use that in a strategic way um, to see how uh, we can uh, use that momentum built within the generation equality to ensure greater um, yeah, uh, investments in the quality child care and all the other related important issues such as decent work, decent work for care workers, because that is absolutely critical as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shalini, do I have uh, time for one more question or? Um, if you keep it very brief, one more question. I mean, two minutes a, and then we very, have to close. Yeah, it's the general question. Anybody, one, any of the speakers could answer. I mean, the last panel. Uh, sustainability has been a, something that we've been discussing for several years. Of many of us have been running childcare centers. Uh, while governments, we, be, we started this campaign, like Mirai Ben said in 16, 2016, and governments are still getting convinced and they are getting ready to play a large role in this while they're doing that. Do, do we have any examples of sustainable pressures uh, across, you know, running in other countries, if uh, any of you can uh, share that, Amanda or Marie or anyone else? Well, I'll just say um, no, 
but that's because they don't need to be sustainable. Childcare should be publicly financed. It's a, it's a public good, it's a positive externality. I don't know of any country in the world where childcare services serve the bottom of the pyramid at scale with good quality only on the income that families can afford. And, and I think we should be honest about that. We need public finance. We need blended finance to do this. And that's okay. It's a public good and we should put money here in this public good. But that said, other people on the call, I think we'll have examples of approaches that are fairly sustainable or largely self-sustaining that are great models to look at. But I don't think that has to be our end goal. Thank you. That's Thank you for that. So we have to close this webinar, which is beautifully organized, wonderful. And kudos to all the women workers, no matter where we are from, no matter where we belong, we speak the same language in one voice. We have the same need. All of us, no matter where we are, we talked about childcare. We talked about going back to work. We've been suffering for like last two years. And what's happening to us? Where do we go? Who's going to take care of us? So that's been the general, uh, you know, essence of what we've been talking today. So thank you for all the three, you know, marvelous women who came here and one with her child, uh, Aline, Annie and Parveen Ben. Thank you so much for sharing your personal experience, sharing your uh, life with us, sharing and telling us what you are going through. We know that, we understand that. And together, all of us from different continents, different organizations, different worlds have come together. And we came together with one, something that tied us together, and that is quality childcare, full day childcare, for the children of all women workers. And today it's, you know, we all realize how much it's important and COVID brought us back together to speak about it. So thank you very much. And thank you to the WIGO and the SEVA team to, for facilitating this, for getting the workers to speak to, to speak to us. And I would like to thank the first uh, panel, uh, discussions, the speakers of the first panel discussion, uh, all three of them, uh, Sumitra, Kanika, and Monica, for bringing out these studies, for sharing with us evidence. We just talked about evidence. Thank you so much for that. And we need to build more and more evidence to convince the policymakers, to convince the countries. And yes, you're right, Amanda, we should not think about sustainability, we should bring the governments to take the responsibility. And that's the message we have to take all of us. Let's join hands and to take this movement forward. And thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Marike, and thank you, uh, Mirai Ben. Uh, finally, I would like to thank the child care uh, campaign, the national campaign uh, team, particularly Shalini, your team, Avi, you all work so well behind the scene and the Vigo communication team. Last two years, we've learned what communication means. We have understood that many of us are still learning. People of my generation are still don't get it, but Vigo communication team, we always go back to them and they are the best. Thank you so much. This was so well organized so that we could see each other, we could hear each other. So finally, once again, Kudos to the women workers. We all are workers and hip hip hooray. Thank you.